I got really sad because I knew how much the Lakota people would sacrifice to protect their land because they have throughout history, right? They have a long history of resistance and protecting the Black Hills and the Badlands and, up, you know, territory all through here. And I was very restless at home. And so we drove from Toronto, jumped in the car. We were on the road by 4 a.m. and we drove straight through to South Dakota. My community had an occupation and protest and resistance. And so I knew what it was like as well to sit and on the front lines of your territory and have police and riot gear marching towards you. We had uh, blocked off the road and then about 100 meters away was about 100 people from the town. You know, as Indigenous people, as we were resisting the colonial violence, I think the town really saw its attack against them when it really wasn't. But that anger that they had really became tangible. They were throwing rocks, they were throwing uh, beer bottles, they were yelling racial slurs. There was uh, OPP and riot gear that came marching in. Full riot gear on their helmets, their assault rifles. And there was about a hundred of them. And uh, all the white people started cheering for them, yelling and screaming all these things. And I was like 18 at the time. And I remember sitting there and being like, I'm gonna get beat up now. Like, you know what I mean? We're gonna get arrested. No one really moved. We sat there and there was people drumming and they continued to drum. And uh, the OPP came and walked in and they uh, formed a line across the road and they were lined up between the native protesters and the um, white protesters. And they turned and they faced the white people and they put their backs towards the native people. It took a second for people to catch on what was happening. And then the white protesters were like, you're facing the wrong way. And it's like, well, no, like these struggles aren't always uh, that narrative you know it's not cowboys versus indians you know it's not that kind of uh, idea anymore right people don't really empathize with indigenous people because there is that kind of perception of a stoic indian person it's hard to understand how deeply grieving a lot of our communities are the underpinnings of all of this are in europe you know, in 1093 or 1094, when the Papal Bulls uh, made it so that non-Christian lands was terra nullius, like that's the legal basis, right, that was used to colonize uh, North America. And the indigenous people here were non-Christians, and so it was like this land wasn't occupied. And so that premise and underpinning was the logic that was used to destroy whole cultures and nations. America, Canada as countries, require the illegitimacy of indigenous peoples to be able to justify their existence and their governance over the land. Because indigenous communities are still actively experiencing colonization, they still experience trauma. Because that's a lot of people say, right? They're like, oh, you should just, you know, go home and get over it. And well, it's hard to get over something that's still actively happening, you know? or that's something that you have to worry about happening tomorrow, you can't really get over that, that impending uh, harm. The more that struggle exists, the more vulnerable Indigenous people are made. Uh, women in this structure are especially vulnerable because they experience, you know, Western colonial gender violence. I joke that I have like one of those signs up in my cubicle that says like, it has been this many days since I've cried at work, and it's usually less than a few. In 2014, there was 1,182 Indigenous women that have been murdered in Canada since the 1980s, and even more that are missing. There's a disproportionate amount of Indigenous women that are missing because they don't have access to justice. They don't have access to a police force that's willing to look for them or to do an investigation that's going to find them. And so you see a lot of women missing where other women, the police would still be looking for them. Canadians become fatigued to seeing another report of a missing woman or a murdered Indigenous woman, but those communities live with that grief for years. I know women that are missing. I know um, women that have been murdered. And so what I do is advocate for policy and uh, programming and responses that's going to end systemic violence against Indigenous women. That's a really strong way that I can support the self-determination of my nation and support the self-determination of other Indigenous nations.
you know, the strength of indigenous cultures is dependent on the health of women and how children are raised. I wouldn't want to presume to speak for any other nation and their culture and their experience with colonialism, but I do support them by coming to hear them. And even if that means sitting in the rain in a tent, I feel like that's the least I can do for a nation that has uh, supported me so much in my identity and how I've grown into a person.